Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Zetacom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD's graphics card plans. Now, before we get further into the video, do know that these are, of course, rumours, so they may not turn out to be accurate. However, a chip hell user by the name of WJM47196, well, that name just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? has actually posted a slew of graphics card rumours and it is worth noting that this user in the past has actually given rumours regarding Threadripper and other graphics cards and they have actually, generally speaking, panned out to be accurate. But of course I do want to give that disclaimer already. So there are a couple of rumours that we have. The first is that we're going to be seeing Polaris 20. Currently, AMD have two sets of graphics cards for desktop. They've got the Polaris lineup, and of course, they've got Vega. But if you look at the performance difference and the price difference between, let's say, the 580 and even the Vega 56, there is quite the discrepancy there. So what's AMD going to do? Now, we'll get into their plans of the future GPUs in a moment, but when I talk about yet another version of Polaris, it'll make sense. So this iteration of Polaris is supposedly going to be appearing on the market by around the fourth quarter of this year. That sounds suspiciously like it's going to coincide with the launch of the GTX 11 series, doesn't it? So what is this going to bring to the table? Well, we don't know all of the specifications, as you'd expect. After all, it is a rumor, but apparently it's built on the 12 and M process, which of course is the very same process that the Zen Pass architecture is built upon. So most likely you're going to be looking at at least a 15% improvement in performance over the previous generation. That is, of course, unless AMD really managed to significantly ramp up clock speeds, or possibly we might see uh, further improvements on memory bandwidth. Perhaps they'll incorporate GDDR6 on the higher end SKUs, or possibly just go with GDDR5X or a larger, wider memory bus. For example, they could put it up to, let's say, 320 bit or something like that. Of course, most folks are going to point to AMD's own official roadmaps, even at Computex, and say, well, hang on a minute. There is no mention of these specific graphics cards there. And I would 100% agree with you, but there is a little to fill the gap between now and the launch of Navi. So I'll get further into the Navi rumors in just a second, but suffice to say, Navi is not supposed to launch until some point in the second half of 2019. RX Vega 7nm, the rumor is that AMD feel that the GPU is just too expensive. So a spoiler alert, but currently of course, RX Vega is rather expensive. And one of the reasons behind that is HBM2. The cost is just, well, ridiculous. In fact, I did actually put out a video a couple of days ago where memory manufacturers were saying, well, they could double, they could quadruple the output of HBM2 and it still would not be enough to supply the demand. And that's not just because HBM2 is going into desktop GPUs, of course. It's being used for servers and goodness knows what else. In other words, it's kicking up the price something awful. So RX Vega 7 is apparently being considered by AMD for gamers, but they just don't know if it's worth it or not. Uh, it's considered to be launched in either late this year or early next year. And of course, we have once again seen those Radeon Pro 20 GPUs uh, which would be once again used uh, using the Vega architecture, but is AMD going to do that for gamers? Now, the rumor is that if they do do that, they're going to kick the amount of HBM2 from 32 gigabytes down to just 16, but even so, it's a rather expensive proposition. So what they're possibly going to do is just get more money for old rope, in other words, once again, Polaris. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. After all, Polaris is not a bad architecture. The only thing that's really hurt Polaris is A, a lack of compute units, and B, clock speeds. And that is, by the way, on both memory and the core. I've been saying for a long time now, uh, regular viewers will probably sing with me, that one of the things that's just baffled me is the absence of a, let's say, a 44 compute unit Polaris GPU. So we don't necessarily need to have a 36 CU um, 590 or 680 or whatever the heck it's going to end up being called. Instead, AMD may choose, they may opt to increase the number of compute units, they may increase the memory bandwidth, and therefore 
Yes, it is technically the Polaris architecture, but there could be a few other tweaks here and there. It might be a bit of a refresh. And honestly, I'd be absolutely okay with that if they managed to get that extra level of performance. So what about Navi? Well, there are a couple of different rumors concerning Navi. The first is that the low power, low performance Navi parts may arrive at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And they are exactly what you'd expect. They are not meant for high-end desktop gaming. They would be for lower performance segments. But of course, they would be built on 7NM. Navi 10 is going to be the true successor to Vega and it's going to appear in the second half of next year. Now here's the kicker, it's not going to actually be that much better in performance than let's say Vega 7NM, but from what we understand, and this is a combination of these current rumors plus some older rumors, the performance for this card, yes, it's going to slightly beat Vega, but the element that's gonna make this card interesting is not the necessarily the performance, it's price slash performance. So apparently this card is gonna be considerably cheaper. So it's gonna be bringing, let's say, the 1080 Ti or 1080 Ti or Vega 64 or whatever, possibly a little bit higher, let's say 10, 15%, 20% higher performance, but crucially, it's going to do it at a decent price. Let's say 250-ish US dollars. Of course, prices are always an estimate and depends on DRAM prices and all the other bits and pieces. Navi 20, though, is going to be the true high end, and that is not gonna launch until 2020. Uh, possibly. So that's obviously quite a long time into the future. Supposedly, and these come from comments from AMD themselves and some other uh, reports, Navi will not be using an MCM type of design, at least for now. Instead, it will use a standardized monolithic design. Now, why is this? Well, it's not necessarily the hardware that's the problem to build. After all, AMD have a lot of experience right now. These are the, this is the same company that's built Zen, right? So that's not the issue. Instead, it's the software side of things and building some type of software layer which would enable the application, let's say a game, to say, oh, okay, this is not like multiple GPUs and we have to treat this like Crossfire. Instead, this is a single GPU and here's how we're gonna do that. So it's probably gonna be a combination of engineering efforts on the software side of things and the graphics uh, hardware side of things and possibly some work from game developers for this to happen. With that said, I wouldn't su be surprised if it does happen in the next couple of years. There are a lot of questions we're left with <laughs> on the graphics card side of things. Honestly, I'm not opposed to another Polaris uh, refresh, and honestly, I half expected it to happen. Um, I, I think that's fine, honestly. I don't see what else they're gonna do. It might frustrate some people. They, you know, it might make some memes if you get another Polaris refresh, but honestly, I'm, I'm okay with it, as long as the performance uptick is worth it, as long as it, I don't honestly think that the 500 series was that much better than the 400 series. I honestly don't think they should have bothered with that refresh. That's my personal opinion. Your opinion may differ, and that's fine. But if they manage a meaningful one with an additional set of compute units, a much higher clock speed, yes, the 500 series did have a small performance increase with clock speeds, but it wasn't as uh, aggressive as perhaps many of us had hoped for. You know, if it had like, let's say for the sake of this video, 300 megahertz addition on the core and a decent amount of extra memory bandwidth, then okay, we could have said, awesome, great. But when you're talking like 100-ish megahertz or something, who cares, right? Burn. Regardless, with the next generation, if they increase the number of compute units, if they're aggressive enough with the core clocks and they manage to ramp them up in a meaningful way, and if they make a couple of other tweaks here and there, then I'm absolutely okay with it. And if they manage to do so at a good price, in other words, if they manage to keep off the NVIDIA <laughs> price couching train, of course, that's a lot of if they manage. So we can only wait and see if, well, they do manage it. So there is one issue, of course, when you're building a large die, and that is the larger you build it, there's a greater chance that one or more of those small components on that die is gonna fail. So let's say that you were to build a four core uh, processor, which is a large die. Well, there's a good chance that at least one of those cores, and by a good chance, I don't mean it's like an 80% chance, but you know, depending on the process you're using and how mature that process is and how experienced as a company you are at developing those processes, there is a chance 
that out of 100 dies, out of 1,000 dies, a number of those will be damaged. And let's say one of those cores won't work, right? And that's, of course, one of the reasons that binning is a thing. In the past, that let's say Intel would produce set various processors, and those that don't necessarily meet a specific speed requirement, they would be binned to lower quality. But sometimes, as you become more... Uh, adapt at creating that particular chip, you might find that, okay, technically speaking, not many processors don't actually meet that speed, so therefore they're just selling processors that, yes, would run at one gigahertz, and they're selling them at 700 megahertz just because they need to fill that segment of the market. But now we're, of course, moving onto a different era, and that is multi-chip solutions. So AMD have actually published a paper which is based around the notion of chiplets. Rather than a large PCB or a large die, instead what you would see is small integrated circuits that would uh, be created to form a whole. With the idea being that you could have CPUs, GPUs, memory controllers, whatever else, all coming together to form different combinations of components which would be for a specific purpose. So for example, a games console or a laptop or a desktop processor or whatever you would need. But there is a problem to this. This is explained by Gabriel Lowell. Um, a deadlock can happen basically when you have a circle or a cycle of different messages all trying to compete for the se some sort of resources causing everyone to wait on everyone else. Each of these new individual chiplets could be designed so that they never have deadlocks. But once I put them together, there are now new paths and new routes that no individual had planned for ahead of time. So what happens is if these engineers do work and follow these fairly simple rules, the component that they're creating can almost think of itself as just one node in a larger network. Now, obviously, this is still pretty early in development. AMD currently, at least as far we know, don't have products which are actively designed around taking advantage of this. This is very different from the monolithic or MCM dies that they've made in the past, but it does have a lot of advantages. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where this will become integral to creating hardware, or at least techniques like it. I really like these advancements in technology, and some of the, sometimes they do turn out to be more proof of concepts that, rather than something that's going to necessarily benefit us right now. It could be a variant of that technology benefits us in the future. And most likely, of course, we might not need these on consumer level parts, at least for some time. But for servers and high performance computing devices, I can imagine that they're probably gonna necessitate this type of engineering much sooner. But either way, it's pretty darn awesome, at least in my opinion. Anyway, we're gonna finish the video with a rather amusingly titled Bean Canyon from Intel. What we have here is up to four cores, eight threads, Intel Iris Plus graphics, as well as the mobile Intel 300 series chipset with enhanced audio, and of course, integrated Intel wireless AC, and perhaps the most surprising of all is more on package EDRAM. We are seeing this number up to 128 megabytes, which will obviously be critical and improving performance with GPU intensive applications. The highest end SKU features a boost clock on the CPU of 4.5 gigahertz, four cores, eight threads, an Iris Plus 655 with 48 execution units, 128 megabytes of RAM. And finally, the GPU itself is running at 1.2 gigahertz. Now that might not sound super duper impressive, but do remember this is an NCU. So for lighter mainstream gaming, for example, if you're wanting to play a little bit of Overwatch or CSGO or any type of light gaming, then this would be a perfect type of um, device for that. Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Normal stuff, like, comment, share, subscribe, give me internet hugs and cookies. And also a big thank you to all of the recent subscribers and all of the support that we've been getting recently. It's absolutely phenomenal and a little bit humbling, actually, to be totally honest with you. There is a lot of stuff coming up on the channel. You saw yesterday we did put out a Zen IPC performance video, which of course investigated Zen Plus against the original Zen architecture. And there is a lot of other cool stuff coming as well. Uh, benchmarking is going pretty darn well. We've got two systems we're currently working on, plus a lot of fun videos in regards to that as well. I can't mention too much, but we are also working with a couple of other manufacturers and I can't say which products they are for obvious reasons, but we're working on some really cool ideas for those. 
And actually, um, a couple of viewers suggested some really cool stuff for me to test as well on that. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone who's been corresponding with us. But with all of that said, thanks very much for watching the video. Uh, I'm going to take this one small opportunity to plug our Patreon, which you can find in the video description. But do know, you don't need to um, donate or anything like that. And just pointing it out if you so desire to take a look, take a peruse, take a browse. Uh, and you can give us a buck if you so desire. If not, then just by golly gosh, watching the video is more than enough. With all of that said, thanks very much. Bye for now.